Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. Mental health with mental health partners. I worked with the Colorado Department of Corrections for three years. I've also um, been running a private practice since 2015. Um, a little bit more like demographic information, like where I'm from, where I went to school. You want want to hear about that? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I grew up in Canada. Um, I didn't leave there till I was 20. And then I moved to the States um, because my father's an American citizen. So I have dual citizenship and I've been here um, ever since. So I have kind of a unique um, cultural background. Um, Canada is different than America in, in a few ways. Um, but I think where I want to start off with how I developed in my profession was I was actually pretty fortunate to know what I wanted to do pretty early on in my life. Uh, my father passed away when I was young, when I was 17. It was rather sudden, and it really kind of like took my legs out from underneath me. I, um, yeah, I was I was angry with the world. I was a little bit angry with him. Um, couldn't focus on school, so my mom and my family directed me to counseling, and I saw a grief counselor for two years, and she was really good. She really helped me kind of like process my deep feelings and normalize what I was going through. And um, not only did I kind of like integrate as much as you can, you know, the loss of a parent, but I realized that psychology was this sort of art and science of talking about what nobody knows how to talk about otherwise. And um, I started like gobbling up psychology texts in my spare time. And it really kind of was like going in uh, easily. And I, and I was like, I noticed that there was something about my personality and just uh, the way that I was structured in my, you know, foundational character that really fit well with kind of the skills that I think are needed in a good therapist. Empathy, um, insight, um, the ability to focus and organize thoughts, um, the like sort of propensity towards depth um, or facing things that you're really uh, scared of. I have sort of like a counterphobic component component in my personality where if there's something that I'm afraid of, I'm actually compelled to move towards it so that I'm not as afraid of it any, anymore. And I think that that's a really big part of psychotherapy is um, facing the parts of ourselves that are very uncomfortable to face, but when we do um, with the right kind of guidance, uh, we can become more than what we are. So. Um, my, my education became, um, or started at Esalen Institute actually in California. So less than conventional place, but it's sort of the, the, the birthplace of the human potential movement. Um, it's a retreat center. So you have all types of teachers coming there from movement to art, to like martial arts, to gestalt therapy, um, and transpersonal approaches. So I really exposed myself. I think I did something like 26 different workshops in the two years that I was there um, and, you know, was able to sort of like integrate them well in the community. We had like this uh, big process group um, every month for the place that I was working. And um, so, yeah, so I sort of started my education off in a less than conventional way. Um, after that, I moved to Colorado in 2005 and went to Neuropa University and got my undergraduate degree. That's when I started working for mental health partners. I got a very entry level job working with kids, worked my way up into working with adults um, until I started my graduate program in 2012 at Reg Regis University. And um, then after that, I decided to start my own practice. Um, 
I've also worked with the Colorado Department of Corrections, like I said, and maybe we can kind of get into that a little bit more. Um, yeah. That seems to kind of be the focus of one of the things you want to talk about. This podcast, like I talk about my personal experience with the criminal justice system. This system, I talk about other people's experiences with the criminal justice system. And then we also discuss um, different topics about what is the criminal justice system, how does it work, and what can be done to improve it. One, we've talked about mental health issues in the criminal justice system, but we've never actually talked to someone who's worked in um, in corrections, especially as a therapist. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to talk to you today because you have that you have that experience. I'm totally cu curious about that because I've never. I don't think I, even while I was locked up, I was able to talk to anyone in that because there's a line out the door to gain, gain access to anyone who has um, mental health, like actual mental health experience. There's a lot of people who need it for sure. And it's, um, it's yeah, it's a very coveted resource in there. So um, I guess my, my follow-up is you mentioned that you had a, you kind of things that would drive most people away would kind of drew you in mm -hmm. i'm curious if that was the case for um for corrections is mm -hmm. if that was something that would normally you know it was it's a tough topic it's a tough area if that actually pulled you in closer well um the first time i went into a correctional facility was at the rifle facility and that was in 2020 and it was actually like well i'll tell the story a little bit so I went in, we did a two and a half day course. I was very much in an assistant role at that time, running a program for the rifle um, inmates. And on our way back is when like the NBA shut down. And I think Tom Hanks reported they had had COVID and mm. everything shut down like on our drive home basically. So COVID hit on our way down um, after my first visit to rifle. My first experience inside the prison honestly it was like it was kind of i had an intense emotional reaction to it um at the rifle facility i think there's close to 500 inmates and there are four men four grown men to a room and it's it was a small room like i saw the rooms and then inside of a, a relatively small building so um and then obviously you know just being in prison and kind of realizing the gravity of what an institution like prison really is um, i came away in my first day like quite affected quite quite heavy if you will um, but because COVID happened um, we didn't go back into the prisons for about a year and a half um, there was incredible restrictions for guests uh, it was very difficult to get in and so i had a lot of time to kind of integrate my experience of um, i guess fear um, to to be in there um also i'll say in that program there was one gentleman who um, like i'm a big guy i'm like six foot 225 pounds um but there was one guy actually every guy in there was bigger than me which was intimidating but there was one guy that was so seemed so scary to me he was he had his shaved head he had beady brown eyes he had tattoos all the way up and uh, up and down his arms up his neck and he had a big scar over his left eye. And um, I remember like being really afraid to interact with him or talk with him. And on the middle of the second day that, the, that we were there, he walked up to me and just started kind of pouring his heart out about how much he was relating to some story that I was talking about. And I ended up connecting with him better than any other guy there. Um, I definitely connected with a few other guys there just kind of like talking at the lunch breaks and some of the group exercises that we were doing. But after that experience, I was just kind of like, huh, like all this stigma that I think most people have about incarcerated people, about people with gang affiliations, about people who have committed crimes kind of went out the window because I really connected with the humanity of, of these people. And after that, I, I really didn't feel afraid in there anymore. And that actually got like even better. And I, I feel, actually, I feel more comfortable inside correctional facilities as a visitor i know it's different if you're a resident 
than I do probably in the regular world because it's so restricted and monitored. There's so much security. And generally, um, from what I understand, um, inmates don't attack visitors. They don't see visitors as a threat. They're actually there to kind of like help and relieve and break up some of the monotony with uh, the incarcerated lifestyle. So it, it actually turned out to be quite the opposite. Some of the most interesting uh, for lack of a better word, lovely people I've ever met in my life have been incarcerated. And that was on with the, your statement about visitors. That was my experience as well. Yeah. That they um, inmates the the vast amount of um, inmates, including myself, understood mm-hmm. people who volunteered to come into the prison, right, uh, and actually come in. Um, are a huge benefit. Anything to keep them there and like and um, like like just whatever they're offering, enjoy mm-hmm. it. Just mm-hmm. and take right. advantage of it. Enjoy it. Um, and they're there to help. It's very right. abundant that anyone who was coming in and volunteered their time was there to help, and it was a big deal. And I there are, um, in Texas, like I'm Jewish, and most of the volunteers who were coming in were Christian and like they wanted to talk about religion. They came in. I didn't agree with most of them. However, I appreciated every single one of them because they came in and they did um, because of what they, what they did. Um, And I feel like most inmates do do that. The only exceptions might be the fact that some, some, some were like, especially guys who had been down for a long time or guys who just in general, just didn't, didn't know how to work with people in general. Mm -hmm. And so they could only see any interaction with a human as transactional. It had to have, there had to be some sort of, um, if you do something for me, I do something for you, vice versa. And that was, they, they viewed volunteers the same way, but that Mm -hmm. was, that was some, that's like a mental health issue in and of itself. The fact that they everything had to be transactional. I mean, I I think you said it a few minutes ago, and um, you know, from a clinical perspective, how could one not have some mental health distress while you're in prison, right? Right. Some some baseline anxiety, some baseline depression, if not more severe things due to your childhood or whatever. Like, it's not a good place. No. Nobody wants to be in prison generally, right? So. Um, the, I mean, the demand and the need for mental health may be most intense inside a prison. That was my, that was my experience. Everyone in there uh, needs some sort of assistance one way or another, no matter whatever the, the situation is. And it can go, that's one, that's one of the ways I feel like it gets into the weeds is people then nitpick, oh, what about this one person? What about that one person? Mm-hmm. Honestly, they all need it. <laughs> everyone everyone mm-hmm. could use help because you don't go in there hospital you don't go to the hospital because you feel like it or like because you you know you just have the urge one day that you want to just you know hang out in the hospital like there's something usually go there because there's something really wrong and you need to get it checked out there's symptoms popping up and that's the same way with jails and prison there's something there's an issue that's coming up that needs to be addressed yeah um I would even argue that some of the bigger issues, if you want to talk about clinical psychology, which is just a way to sort of categorize some mental health dysfunctions, um, the, there's like a concentration of people, especially cluster two people. So that means people that have narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. Um, I mean, especially the first two, um, which are basically empathy disorders, people that have a very difficult time empathizing, um, that have a very difficult time not manipulating, like you're saying, transactional experiences. I, I mean, it's it doesn't take a genius to, to figure where is a concentration of those types of people. They're in prison, right? Like they've done stuff in their life that have hurt other people. Um, and, and you find a lot of those types of guys and women um, who are like that. and. Um, I was really inspired by some of the work that um, I did there and how it affected those guys specifically with their with their issues. 
I wish um, our program got a little bit more notoriety because I think clinicians and psychiatrists would be doing backflips if they if they saw what what kind of impact we were having on the guys. Well, that goes into one of my other questions, which is, are there any practices you found that were extremely successful or effective or that people should know about in general? Yeah, so the program um, that I helped run really uh, aimed at increasing communication, empathy, and conflict resolution skills. So um, the, the best practice that I that I could think of um, in terms of making improvements in this, in this matter is um, like a, like a listening exercise. So um, I think a lot of the more robotic unconscious way of listening to somebody is like kind of taking what they're saying, interpreting it in your own world and your own meaning, and then responding, like having your turn to speak. Right. And so we just kind of take turns speaking. Um, a more effective way that can actually build empathy is if you listen to a person, but really just like hear and even repeat to yourself their words. So not your interpretation of their, of their words, um, not what you think they mean and what they're really trying to say, just exactly what they're trying to say. And this is one of the exercises that we did was somebody would talk about something important in their lives. The other person would just listen. After that person finished speaking for a few minutes, the other person would reflect what they heard them say using basically just their words, repeating just their words. And when you do that adequately, you um, not only really get the other person, they hear themselves. And in that, there's like kind of more interpersonal connection that happens. Um, and then they can add stuff. They're like, wow, yeah, is that what I said? And geez, I guess what I really mean is, and they can add a little bit more information. They can tell, the, tell you a little bit more about this important thing in their lives. And then another step is to share impact. So it's like how what you said emotionally landed for me and how I can maybe relate to you, how I can maybe like even find a little bit of empathy for you. Maybe I don't agree or don't see things exactly the way you do, but like I can relate like something like that happened to me in my life and this is how it impacted me. And so like all that can actually create more connection. It creates more um, ability to really get each other at a more human level, ability to like activate your heart a little bit instead of just like transactional or kind of more prison culture experiences. Okay. Yeah, that's really great to know. And that, um, I could imagine that that's one of the hardest things I've ever had to come uh, to overcome in there is mm -hmm. <laughs> like having uh, it's communication issues. It's constantly mm -hmm. issues. And then on top of that, there's always stories and gossip. And that was a huge source of frustration um, yeah. dirt, um, while incarcerated. And mm -hmm. I, I've seen many guys deal with that. Yeah. Um, so what other than that like other than like the practices what were the big lessons you got from your time um working inside corrections um i would love to see some level of a like a marker or some indicator in um, prisoner reform uh, if and when individuals are truly remorseful and trying to become better. Um, I worked in some intense facilities, including Colorado State Penitentiary, which houses a lot of lifers, a lot of people who've committed really serious crimes like murder or rape. And um, some of them have a lot of difficulty taking any responsibility for what they did or um, any any ownership and having humility. But a lot of guys do have humility. A lot of guys deeply, deeply, deeply get that they made a mistake and are, are beautifully motivated to actually become better men, uh, to heal, to like learn about themselves. Um, so things like 
restorative justice. I would love to see more in the system. Of course, um, when there's victim impact, whether it be families or individuals directly affected, needs to play a crucial role, right? Like, um, if if I perpetrated a crime against you, and your life is still severely impacted by something that I did to you, um, there needs to be some justice with that, I believe, um, and until it kind of feels fair. Um, that's still like a consequence for action. And I think it's fair. What I see a lot in the correction system is that some recipe of the law is applied to an individual and they have to do a lot more time than I think is just. Uh, I met, I met one guy, um, who actually, he had trouble coming to our classes because he was really fighting incredibly deep depression. I think he was 52 years old. Um, and he committed uh, a series of crimes in his early twenties. Um, and I think it was three felonies in a row and it wasn't good stuff. It was like drugs. And I think like an armed carjacking and, uh, maybe some like assault or something like that. But because it was like a three strikes you're out sort of thing in California, because he had committed three felonies, his penalties were three X multiplied. So, um, I think he was doing something like 113 years. For those three things, I mean, for sure, not good things and need to do some time. But because of the way that the law is written, the, he was probably never getting out for some, you know, some really dumb shit that he did in his early 20s. And that that's it. His life is over. I don't think he killed anybody. Um, I don't think he like seriously, seriously injured anybody. Um, he, you know, he, he got caught up in drugs, which a lot of people do, especially in their twenties. And that's it. His life's over. And, and he was such a humble, good man by his, you know, by this age, by 52 and right, perhaps rightly depressed, you know, like the way he talked about it, I was like, yeah, that's, that's messed up, man. That's not fair at all. And he has to live with that for the rest of his life in prison. And so I think things like that really need to be looked at. And I mean, to be blunt, there's a part of me that says, who's the criminal? If you're punishing somebody to an unfair degree like that, who really is the criminal from a, you know, humanitarian perspective? Like that doesn't seem right to me. That is an excellent question. The one of the, so on that, that point you brought up the like at the start you were talking about the the remorse mm -hmm. and that is an issue that comes up again and again in from from the initial hearings sentencing mm -hmm. to even when you come up for parole mm -hmm. do you how would do you have any idea of how you would look for it or what like what features you look for for as far as remorse or telling guys who are actually remorseful versus mm -hmm. not so much. Yeah. I, and I have sympathy for this. I, I, um, I, I'm not naive to the fact that this can be manipulative, that, um, I can, I can be like, Oh, they want me to show remorse. So I'll act remorseful, but actually I don't give a shit. And there are certain types of people who can really pull that off as good actors. They can really manipulate a lot of people around them. I think to some degree, you can't nip all of that in the butt. I wish, I bet you there is a way to really measure remorse if, if you can press a person and ask them a certain amount of questions. Um, but also, I think most people, most people understand if, you know, I'm speaking with you over time and I did something, you're going to know if I'm, if I'm BSing or not to some degree, right? unless I'm a good actor, you're going to know to some degree that, uh, I am remorseful and that I, you know, I do feel deep empathy for the situation. Hopefully people more than myself. Um, but you know, that level of discernment 
I guess needs to be trained and I would love to see it in parole boards more. Um, a lot of people that I've seen in parole boards and correctional officers for that matter, not everybody, I don't want to generalize too much, um, kind of like punishing uh, inmates and they like to kind of make people miserable. And uh, again, I think that there's something unjust about that. It is kind of how the, what the, they're basing it on and it's because they don't have the restorative justice aspect it built into it right now you can find shakedown merch graphic novels and other projects at waywardpress.com that's w-a-y-w-o-r-d press.com if you would like to support the shakedown get exclusive content and watch episodes live you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown like subscribe and leave a comment to give malone that inner peace he so richly deserves